everyone welcome to movement and me an initiative that is designed for budding artists across the world who wish to pursue their career in art i'm your host deharika and on this show you will hear artists talk about their lives and the choices they had to make in pursuit of arts you will also get to use some tips and key learnings from the lives of these artists along with a detailed discussion on their areas of interest so quickly hop on to a journey into the world of arts along with us today's guest is dr ann newgent she is a british dance critic and a senior lecturer in dance at the university of chichester where she is also the program leader for the master's degree in dance research Her specialist areas of teaching include philosophy, aesthetics, criticism and writing. Her research mainly focuses on the choreographer, the choreography of the American dancer, choreographer and educator William Forsythe. She's currently working on a book through which she's aiming to encourage dancers to write. Hello Anne and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for agreeing to be part of this show with us. Hi Niharika and hi to everyone uh, i thought that was a most beautiful lively funny jolly energetic introduction so let's try and keep it lively and energetic thank you and that's so sweet of you well how are you today i'm cold because i'm in the south of england mm. and it's pouring with rain however i'm in beautiful countryside and everywhere i look the trees are green there are sheep in the fields and everything is very beautiful. Oh that's so beautiful. I think I just pictured myself being with you over there. So I think that's great. Um I'm going to get started very quickly and I think I would love to know a little bit about your journey so far in this field of dance. How and where did you get started with dance? Well, let me address our listeners and see if you can find parallels with what happened to me. I of course never set out for a career in dance but I was about 10 when I was taken to a ballet performance and I loved it and the strange thing is I couldn't wait for it to end because I wanted to get up and dance and it was like a call from god and I knew I had to dance but my wonderful parents did not want me to have a career as a dancer because they felt that it was very insecure and they're right of course however when i became so determined to dance they gave in and they sent me to a theater school where i majored in dance i specialized in ballet um but i learned all other kinds of dance and drama and singing and i mention this because i think to all of you starting out in a career or still at school it's very important to be as broad minded as you can to learn everything possible so i went to a school called arts educational and i graduated from that into the company that is now english national ballet and that was great very hard work um and um but i began to find i didn't really like being out of the daylight all day in a big theater you just have one dark one light one light bulb hanging down it's very dark and i like the daylight so i stayed with the company a little and then i went to sweden to join the gothenburg ballet which was an entirely different experience wonderful to work in another country for a year to begin to experience different cultures and a different language and i enjoyed that but at the end i cancelled my contract because i didn't want to be stuck in a dark grimy theater all day but also here's another thing i'd found what i wanted from ballet and i love dancing just as niharika loves i know bharatanatyam and all of you listening will probably love dancing it's something that the body has to do so anyway i found a, a brilliant teacher who gave me that wonderful sense of coordination so that everything i did was joyous joyous to be dancing joyous to be turning lots of pirouettes to be jumping high in the air so i felt 
very fulfilled as a dancer. I wish I could have gone on and been a serious principal dancer, but I didn't have it in my body. So then I gave up dancing and I did all kinds of other things, earning money, necessary things. Um, and then, and here, here was the next major step in my career. I went to a dance performance again, and I thought, why is the auditorium only half full? Why don't people know about this very good performance by a British company called Northern Valley Theatre? So I went home and I wrote about it. Now, I didn't know how to write. So I remember sitting at my dressing table and having lots of bits of paper and writing by hand and shuffling the paper and getting it all around. Then I typed it and I sent it off to some local papers. And at that time, I was working for a publisher, helping with the, the press relations. And I suddenly got a telephone call from the local paper saying, um, terribly sorry, we can't use your review. Well, I didn't expect them to use it, but the man said, um, we're going to put you on our panel of arts critics. And true to his word, he put me on his panel. And every week after that, I went to see theatre, poetry readings, orchestral concerts, art galleries, dance performances. They never asked me about my expertise. I just wrote. That was fantastic. So I'm telling you this because that was my idea. I felt I had to do something. So if you, in thinking about your careers, have to do something, uh, then you have to go ahead and do it. But before I move on to the next stage of my career and what happened after that, I'm actually going to throw the question back at Niharika because I happen to know she's been already on an extraordinary career journey. So how did you get into dance, Niharika? Oh, thank you so much, Anne. Um, I think it's gonna be hard to follow up with what you just said, <laughs> but I'm gonna try. Um, I think my interest in dance started when I was four years old, like you just described. But um, for me, dance as a performance was not something that I was, for some reason, appealing, appealed to or, you know, attracted to as much as I was attracted to reading and writing. Um, so when I actually was in my bachelor's, I got introduced to the academics of dance and I found myself wanting to read more and more and more. It was like somebody just opened a door for me and I just couldn't stop running through all of them. And it was just amazing as an experience. So I started reading and reading and reading and I found myself in this space where I knew more about dance after having read through it than I would have probably known if I had just stayed in performance. Also because that's how my state of mind was at the time. But I loved movement and I love dancing. So it's not like I stopped dancing. I just did not go into performance. I used my dancing and I my desire to move to let me guide myself and my research into finding new ways of looking at dance. So dance is not just what happens in the body, but also how you experience it through movement. But it's also very difficult to write about it sometimes because it's so experiential in nature that we tend to fumble with words and try and find uh, you know, ways in which we can express ourselves. So that's where I found myself being stuck. And then I came into dance research where I was introduced to a lot of material to read and write, which actually helped me write a lot more about my experiences and find newer ways of connecting what I had been a part of and what I was currently experiencing. So currently, as I am continuing my uh, journey in dance, this is what I'm constantly doing. I'm reading, I'm, I'm dancing, I am moving, and I'm just trying to bring them all together onto one platform to see if I can deliver it to the students who I teach in school today. I might tell you that Niharika surprised us all at Chichester. She did something no one else has ever done. She applied to do the MA in dance research in August. Now, normally people apply round about March or April, and we yeah. do quite a lot of interviewing, talking to them. They have to write proposals about what they will do. Niharika came out of the blue one August, um, and we did, I suppose it was a Skype interview that we did yeah. with you. Um, and three weeks later, our semester began, and Niharika said, I'll be there. Now, in order to come from India 
to England, you've got to get a visa, you've got to do a million and one things, you've got to buy, get a winter coat because you know it's going to be cold. Niharika is the only person I've known so far to do it in three weeks. So that tells you the kind of amazing person she is. She's a great pioneer for dance and she's going to take you all in great directions. Thank you so uh, much. Well, I mean, it was extraordinary what you did. I'm going to go back to my career now. Please. Like Niharika, I always read. And if there are any budding dancers out there, please don't think that the body is more important than the mind. Feed the mind with novels. Read trash or read good novels if you can. When I was in theatres and there were long delays while the lighting was done and we had to sit in dressing rooms, I would escape into a novel. When we were on coaches touring, I would escape into reading that took me into different worlds. So I always did that. I did not think of becoming a writer until one day my brother, who worked at the BBC, and who also has very strong connections with India and who, who delivers uh, lectures himself on uh, radio journalism um, in Delhi. Um, he bumped into the deputy editor of a newspaper called The Stage. And my brother, unbeknown to me, said to this guy, Anthony, um, oh, do you want a dance critic? So Anthony said, no, we've got a dance critic, but we could do with a deputy. So guess what? So I started writing a lot more after my experience with the local paper. And very sadly, the main critic became ill um, and I was there ready to step into his place. And I wrote for the stage every week for 17 years. That meant going to all manner of dance performances from, I'm sure you will have heard of Covent Garden, to experimental workshops, different kinds of cultural dance. I, I also wrote about theatre. I did a lot of lunchtime plays. I had to earn a living. I did children's theatre. I even once went to court to report on a case that um, someone in the theatre uh, had come up against. So anyway, I wrote and wrote. Then I started writing a supplement for the stage and that was masses of pages. Um, and then the next development was um, going to the ladies, as you do when you're at an event, and bumping into a very um, famous prima ballerina called Beryl Gray. Have any of you heard of Beryl Gray? She was extraordinary. She said to me, would you like to edit a journal? Because she, at the time, was head of the Imperial Society of Teachers of Dancing, which is a big body of teaching. So I said, yes, I'd love to edit a journal. Thank you very much. And then I thought, how on earth do you edit a journal when you don't know anything about it? So a bit like Niharika, I went to friends and I said, how do you edit? And I, I talked to people, and I did what I could. And I was very blessed, very lucky to have this experience of editing. Um, and I'm glad to say I learned a lot about editing. You always want a job that will teach you something. You don't uh, always want to be giving up. You want something that will give back to you. So all my work has given back. To me. So then um, David Leonard, who was uh, who ran the amazing bookshop in London called Dance Books, some of you may have bought books from him, um, said to me, would I like to found a journal? So I, I was founding editor of a journal called Dance Now. Um, and that was great. And I did that for some time. The great thing about editing is you can have lots of ideas, you can commission people to do things for you. And they always come back with something completely different from what you expected. So after that, um, there was a very famous publication called Dance Theatre Journal. And that was edited by an amazing man called Chris Marini, And very sadly, he died. And so I got the call again from the director of Laban. Uh, you may have heard of Laban, Trinity Laban, London, very famous um, academy for dance. Uh, university for Dance, um, and I edited their journal for some time, loved it. And then I need to step back a little if I'm not talking too much. Um, I was in the kitchen with the man I married soon after, and I said to him, do you know, I wish I'd been to university. And he said, just a few words that changed my life, he said, well, why don't you? 
So I applied to the University of, Stud uh, Ch University of Surrey, Surrey University. Um, and um, they took me to do, in to do a master's degree. I didn't have to do a BA. My professional experience of dancing, writing, editing was enough. I might tell you, I had to do exams to get in. It wasn't easy. So I did a master's degree part-time for two years, loved it and hated it, um, was reduced to giving up. And I'm saying this to give you hope. One of the texts that I read was so difficult, I couldn't cope. So the man who was my beloved Tony, who was my, by then my husband, also read it and we talked and talked and talked until I began to enjoy the complexity of this. He spent eight hours on it, can you imagine? And I still go back to that text, it's still difficult. But anyway, so I did my master's degree and at the time I was editing journals um, and I'd been told during the master's degree it had been suggested that I might go on and do a PhD. So um, Niharika mentioned that my research is in the into the choreography of William Forsyth. So I said, yes, I did a PhD. Now that sounds rather easy. It was sheer hell at times. It was unbelievably difficult. A PhD takes over your life. There's no easy way at all. I went a lot to see Forsyth's company in Frankfurt. And because I'd already written about some of Forsyth's work and he'd read it, that became my passport to going to his company, to watching class, rehearsals, going through the archives. I spent hours photocopying material. You can see some of the stuff um, that I've in folders over here. So anyway, then I, then I, I did my um, PhD at Surrey and it, it was very difficult and I remember Tony and I at the end were kind of getting all the papers together um, and almost getting rid of one chapter at the very last minute. But anyway, I did it, I did the Fiverr and I got the PhD and that was wonderful. And um, while I was at Surrey, they had said to me, we've got a visitor, that wasn't what they said to me. This is my little Norbinu, which means jewel. She's a very much a Zoom, I call her my kitty, she's a cat, but she's my kitty and she's got a brother around somewhere. Um, so um, while I was at Surrey, they offered me a fellowship and that involved, the condition if I took it was that I had to do some teaching. So I, I did my first uh, term of teaching without knowing how to teach. How do you teach? Well, the answer is you let your students teach you. And one student at the end of my first term, when he had to do an evaluation, come here, little one, uh, said to me, or said, Anne talks too much. And that was such a helpful thing to say. So now I try and listen to my students. And before I tell you the next stage, I'm going to let Niharika talk. So tell us more about your journey. You graduated with your MA and we were thrilled at the way you did it. You worked very, very hard. Um, you went back to India, then what happened? Um, so I finished, I finished my master's um, at the University of Chichester and then I did um, shadow teaching with Anne herself for about a semester where I actually got to learn um, how to do the nuts and bolts of referencing. And I actually dig, dug deeper into the entire referencing process while creating the entire document for the university. I also ended up learning a lot about dance criticism because I was shadowing her in one of the classes. Um, it was amazing. I came back and uh, surprisingly, I got myself enrolled as a faculty of performing arts at the university, um, sorry, at Shivnada School in Noida. Uh, I'm currently teaching integrated arts at the school and it's just amazing to be a part of this institution. Um, and I don't think I would have been a teacher had it not been for the shadow teaching that I did with um, Anne at the University of Chichester. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. And uh, I think I, it, is a, it means a lot because you believed in me and um, you, know, you actually allowed me to grow and find my path when I wasn't sure I would be able to find one myself. I might say to all our listeners, watchers, that Niharika was going to be a success, whatever she did. It's her personality, she's driven, she's highly motivated. 
And perhaps all these things are very useful to you. So if you're looking for a career in dance, there are so many things that you can do. You can just by using your own initiative. So I would say, be imaginative. So I'm, I'm, I'll go back to my story. Um, so I was teaching at Surrey, and then I got a job teaching at now is what it, at what is the University of Winchester. I did that for a year, and then Chichester asked me if I would do some lecturing for them. Um, and that was 20 years ago last Monday, and I've been there ever since. And I continue to work as a dance critic and writer. Um, but in truth, I think the thing that I most enjoy is working with students because of the communication. It's lovely to have knowledge, uh, and I guess I do have quite a lot of knowledge and experience in dance and to be able to share it. So that's when I really enjoy working. Um, I love giving lectures. Um, secretly, I spend a lot of time preparing for them before, to, because we lecture without, um, we don't read our lectures. We lecture slightly spontaneously, but aren't I lucky? So everything I do, I would say feeds into my teaching. And I um, have some wonderful students. I work with small groups of students, but let me change thinking a little. Let me change direction and think about who might be listening. Um, let's think about the importance to dance or to being a human being of the body and the mind. Now, sometimes if you want to be a dancer, you think only the body matters. And sometimes if you want to be an academic, only the mind matters. But what is wonderful about what we do is that you have to have the connection between the body and the mind. Um, but I will be honest and say that we work with a lot of students who are not particularly interested in reading, who don't like writing, often because they've been frightened of it at a young age. Often, we have a lot of students who have dyslexia, which means they have trouble seeing letters, reading. Um, often they're very intelligent, but reading and writing are tough. But equally, sometimes our students who find writing most difficult become the best writers. It's extraordinary. So I like to teach people to understand that the body has so much knowledge in it. And I like to share this idea. You can read and write. You can write because of things you know in your head. How are you going to get into your mind and your way of thinking? I was teaching our new MAs last, uh, yesterday, no, on Friday, um, writing from within, which is a special induction course that I do, or lecture that I do. I get them to move, and I get them to think about what it feels like moving. I get them to move and look at each other. What are other people doing? What can they learn from them? Can they write? So um, I had a lot of people yesterday, actually MAs are usually a bit more interested than some of the BAs. Um, they wrote some very nice descriptions of dance and the word snaking came up into it. They say, look, my hand is already snaking, perhaps your hand is and corkscrew. And when we talk about snaking, we understand what that kind of movement is. When we talk about corkscrewing, we can see something. So I, um, what I believe in is trying to break down the barrier between people who only want to dance and people who only want to write. And then you've gone silent on me, Niharika. No, um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold up a book and I didn't put it here for this purpose, it just is beside me. Here is a book that inspires me. It was published when we started doing philosophy and aesthetics and you were in the group and it was such an eye opener. So um, actually, let me ask you, what is philosophy? It's love of knowledge and wisdom. What is embodiment, knowledge and wisdom that's in the body? So let that, let that come out in your thinking. Even if you're very young, you can still be a philosopher. We're all philosophers. Think about your experiences. Think about what you see, what you might write about. But the other thing I think we should talk about, Niharika, is thinking who might be listening. Um, let's talk about different careers in dance, which is very different in England, in Britain, in Europe, from what it might be in India. 
How many universities do you have in India? Do you know running dance degrees? Um, well, particularly prof uh, performing arts, um, bachelors or masters, there are, there are a few, but I'm not sure if we have enough anthropology, um, you know, um, culture related, or even for that matter, dance politics as a course or dance research as a course as options. But um, we do have the new educational policy from 2020, which kind of makes arts uh, a main subject and mandatory for everybody to at least read and learn something about. So, wow. yes. So this year we are hoping that because schools are going to talk and discuss and also, you know, teach a lot about uh, arts, there's going to be an influx and probably an introduction to different arts courses um, in the universe, at the university and college levels as well. So we're hoping for that kind of to happen. But I think in order for that to happen, it is important for us to know what is possible and what can be made. So for me, honestly, I think it just starts off with the basic question of what exactly do you want to make happen in the field of dance? Not exactly what's already there, but also what you can do with what you know. Because that's one of the biggest, I think, you know, motivators at the end of the day as well. And where do you think these new areas of study will happen in India? Um, there, were, there are quite a few candidates. Um, I can't really say anything about it yet because I'm not sure what's happening in their boardrooms. So we're going to have to just wait and watch to see which universities take up this opportunity first. But I'm actually hopeful about a few, few places. As soon as they introduce something, I'm going to put it on my channel and talk about the courses a little bit. Oh, that's fantastic. I hope I get to hear all this. Yes. But, but anyway, let, let, let's think about parents with young children oh, yes. who might be interested in careers in dance. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the situation in Britain is very different from the situation in India. But there are so many different careers um, that you can go up, your children or your teenagers can go out into yes. and um, develop. Um, dance is academically a young um, area of research so there's so much more to be done um, and when Niharika is talking about politics and awareness of the body somatic awareness we run courses in this we run MAs in this BAs focusing on the politics society culture what does culture mean there's so much to work into um, but you can also go out and work as administrators oh. form a company you can teach, you can lecture, you can become a journalist, a critic, you can engage in dance research and do a PhD and your, your work then has to be original and it should make a global impact. You can think of all kinds of jobs of your own. You can be an impresario, you can think, you can, uh, what else can you do? You can, go into companies and uh, everyday um, industry and teach people how to move. You can teach people the value of having a healthy body. You can promote dance in different ways. You can make films, you can make television, you can talk about dance, you can become a broadcaster. Talking about dance on radio is a very interesting idea. I believe it can be done very well. Um, and all the time you can be collecting words and ideas about dance. So the important thing is to find a career that will feed you. And I'm not, of course, talking about money. Very few people get rich working in dance, but we get rich in other ways, don't we, Niharikya? Yeah. Uh, so you, you can um, invent careers. You need to work hard. Everyone in dance, I believe, works exceptionally hard. We don't count our hours. We, um, our students have to be on campus sometimes from quarter to nine in the morning until 10 o'clock at night because they have classes in the studio, they have lectures, they have to go into the library and read and research. Um, and then they maybe will be choreographing something in the evening or being choreographed on and so they must work. Or they've got deadlines to meet and they've got long essays. It's my belief that every single person involved in dance should be able to write well 
that's a bit radical because some people don't like writing. And I must say, some students come to us who've been very badly taught about writing. But I want to wave the flag and say, let's value the spoken and the written word as much as we value what the body can do in dancing. Um, it's very interesting you talk about this necessity and the need for, you know, dancers to write. That actually prompts me to the question on your current book that you're exploring. It's kind of where I wanted to head to as well, because it's, a, it's I think, quite revolutionary in itself to be writing a book about dancers who must also learn how to write. Uh, but tell me a little bit more about why you think it's necessary and what kind of drives you and how exactly do you think this book on, you know, encouraging dancers to write would be um, having an impact on dancers? What exactly are you going to give them? I know you can't teach, give us a lot of information, but just as much as you can. It's because I think that I'm passionate about dance. I hope I've established that. But I'm also passionate about language and the written word. I'm passionate about dance being thought of as highly as the study of any other academic subject. It's just as difficult. What we don't realize is this knowledge we have in our bodies as dancers. And what academics don't realize is the knowledge they have in their bodies as non-dancers. They put this barrier between. So that's what I want to do. I want to unlock it. Also, I think language is such a beautiful thing. And working with metaphors, there was an American critic who sadly died in the last century um, called Edwin Denby. And his great gift was to be able to write using very simple words, but very poetically, very visually. So he would he wrote an essay called Dancers, Buildings and People in the Streets that give you some idea of his powers of observation. Actually, what do buildings look like? What is the room that all of you are in now? Could you shut your eyes and could you describe it? Could you write about it and make it vivid so that it communicates with someone else? Um, I suggested to my students on Friday that the next time they were walking to campus, they might look at all the different kinds of bricks they see in the different buildings. So dancers, use your imagination. What can you see? What can you communicate to the rest of the world? How can you tell other people that dance is extraordinary? Dance gives you so much. It gives you your education. It can give you your life. So that's why I want to write about writing a book about dance, because I want to draw people's knowledge out of their minds and onto the written word. I think that's just, that's extraordinarily amazing. And I, I just don't have any words to describe the excitement that I have, <laughs> that's brewing inside of me because I love to write and read myself. So I can't wait for this book of yours to get released. And I would probably want to be the first one to grab my hands on it and just go through it through and through. Uh, but I think it's really, you're absolutely right. It's really important for us to find a way to get all of that knowledge that we have gathered in, inside our bodies over the years and, you know, express it onto paper because otherwise it's just in the body and nobody else gets to learn from it. And it's just a beautiful feeling to just share your ideas, your thoughts, your experiences with others, because we, you never know who you might end up inspiring, you know, just by, your, by you sharing your ideas, your experiences. And the idea of just being able to inspire even one person in the entire world is just enough for us dancers, because I think at the end of the day, dance is inspirational. Dance is everything and so much more. Uh, that brings me to my, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> now, let's draw us together as dancers and writers, and let's make a fellowship out of this, out of connecting between our countries. Oh my God. Okay, so whoever's listening to this, you're more than welcome. I'll put Anne's page on the University of Chichester in, one, in the links description below. So you can take a look at what she does. You will probably also find a little bit of a detail and how to get in touch with her on the page as well. 
So go ahead and try your luck. She might actually be able to inspire you a lot more than just this YouTube series. And trust me, she is quite adamant and she is quite knowledgeable. She'll teach you a lot. She'll actually guide you as much as she can, like she does her students all the time. I have a question for you about dance criticism, Anne, and how your journey in this field of, you know, critiquing dance has helped you learn more about dance and maybe even learn more about appreciating dance because I think that's something that's very important when it comes to watching a performance or just understanding the nuances of a performance. Can you tell us a little bit more about this idea of appreciating dance and what does it mean to everybody, including yourself? Oh yes, but that, that's another hour long talk. I will try and be quite succinct. So asking you the question, how do we look at dance? Where is meaning found in a dance? How do we make sense of what we see? What are the qualities of movement? What is the character of the dance? These are all really, in a sense, philosophical issues that we can ask about dance. Um, the important thing is to respond, I think, initially to the magic of dance and not to be too analytical. However, for those people who despise analysis, I believe analysis takes you much deeper into the dance and allows you to see more things. So where does the meaning come from? Is it in the choreography? Is it in the interpretation by the dancers? Or is it in the experience of the person watching? It comes from many different things. And the more you read, the more you go out into the world, the more you know, the more you can see in dance. You could argue that dance is about something beautiful. And beauty itself, as Niharika and I have discussed many times, is a deep philosophical issue that we could go on talking about for the rest of our lives. But the dance is not only about being beautiful, the dance is about asking questions it's about reflecting life. How much can we see? Is dance always political? Is, always, is dance always socially concerned? Uh, what, how is our state of being changed by watching? You can write about how you feel. Um, I might say that readers don't usually want to know about the critic, so you don't want to write I, 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 I. But what insight can you bring to watching? And that's where the knowledge and the feelings in your head and body come to fruition. You can draw on what you felt when you watched a dance performance and you can encourage other people to see more in the dance. Edwin Denby, and I've already mentioned him, said, we only see a little. There is always more to see. So that's why I say to you, whatever you're going to do, build awareness of observation. Notice things, notice people. And I'm going to give you, everyone listening, a little task, which is what I give my students. Will you, when you next go out, watch how people walk in the street, watch how they hold their bodies, watch what they're carrying. Are they carrying um, pressures in the mind? Are they carrying bags? What does that do to the body? What's the speed? So in just saying those few short words, I hope that gives you an idea of how you can write about dance. I don't write, one more point, as a critic to be negative. I write because I want to see, I hope. Wow, um, um, I'm speechless and that's, I think a lot. Um, so everybody who's listening in, you have a task at hand. I know it's COVID time, so just observe whoever you're maybe living in with, or maybe just when you go buy groceries outside. If you don't do, just wait on whenever you get an opportunity to step out of the house with all precautions, mask on, sanitizer and stuff, and just see what you can explore on the outside. Because you, we, we're all stuck at home now, I think we are already sort of getting quite aware of everything that's happening around us because we suddenly are exposed to it again and this distancing has actually made us more aware of everything that we are kind of exposed to all of a sudden, which is different from maybe our rooms and our bedrooms and our kitchens. So just go ahead and see what you can explore and maybe write a little bit about it. 
You're also more than welcome to post your responses in the comments below for us to know more about it. So Anne, coming back to you again, um, tell us a little bit about the dance research program that you have so beautifully crafted. And why do you think you decided to you know, create a program called Dance Research? What is it that you wish for the students to get out of it? And I, as part of the, as part of the you know, program myself, I know what I got out of it, but as someone who's designing the curriculum, what has been your aim and has it changed over the years as you have implemented it and you've experienced students receiving it differently? So tell us a little bit about that. What a lovely question. Well, Niharika, as you know, uh, our teaching is informed by the people we are teaching. So it changes each year according to the students we have. So an MA in dance research is going to change your life. It's going to make you think dif differently. It's going to be very, very demanding. And I think everyone goes through periods of difficulty. But those who come to do this degree um, must come with something independent that they want to study. And we have different interests. This year we have one student who is um, who wants to explore how dance is responded to socially and are people aware of dance and what is happening in dance. Now dance is very often quite low down in the pecking order. So she's going to be exploring the notice that non-dancers take of dance. Then we have another student who wants to concentrate on Thai dance and the dances of Thailand, which is very exciting. She also wants to look at Japanese culture and Japanese dance. Then we have another student who has um, a disability. She has very poor eyesight. So she's looking at the art of seeing. And seeing, as you know, is not just physically seeing, but it's about thinking and it's about understanding ideas and knowledge. So those are examples of three of our students. Niharika, do you want to talk about what you concentrated on as a, when you were doing? What was your independent independent research about. That I might explain that that's a module that our students have to do. Yes. Um, so in my independent research, I kind of did a compare and contrast between the, the, the kind of dance performance that were created in the modern period and the performances that were created in the postmodern era. Now there are two different eras have been defined over a period of time based on the kind of changes that or movements that occurred in the arts field and have different causes and reasons for their uh, initiations. Um, so I was focusing on zero degrees uh, on one hand and this you, idea of- what, what is zero degrees? Oh yes. <laughs> so zero degrees is a performance that was created by Sidi Larbi Shirkawi and Akram Khan, two very famous choreographers, which um, actually explores a lot about the journey of a man who ended up going to his native country and describing his entire sort of experience there in the form of a narrative movement based choreographic piece. It's very interesting because it has a lot of content in it. For anybody who does not know what Zero Degrees is, I'm going to post a link on my description box below. Just go take a look at the trailer. We'll try and see if we can get our hands on the Zero Degrees performance, but I'm, not, I'm gonna have to do a lot of for that. Eventually, hopefully we'll also get Akram Khan on over here. So maybe he can talk a little bit about it too. Oh, I've got it. I could go and get it, hold it up. Okay, um, so what did, you do, what did you do with Zero Degrees? So we kind of, I kind of explored how, you know, the performance set out um, in the postmodern period and how it's different from what was created in the modern period and how it's slightly might have similarities to the expressionism that was uh, as a, you know, as a theme that was going on in the modern period. So I was trying to look for similarities and differences between a within a performance, which might be based in the modern era and also has traces of what's happening in the postmodern space. So um, that's kind of where I worked on. You know. I, I'm gonna pick up and go back to your question, which in case it's useful to develop this a little bit more. Any dance degree depends on a network of people, a network of studies, a network of responsibilities. So when Niharika did her masters with us, 
um, she was uh, with a group of students who were focusing on dance research, but we also do other degrees. We do degrees in performance, we do degrees in advanced performance, somatics, choreography, distance learning, and various things. Um, we as a team of tutors, we're about, about 20, um, we devise modules, we devise lectures, some, some of the team focus on technique, um, some focus on choreography. So your degree is part of different things that you're doing. We hope that all our dance researchers will go into the studio and do some classes, um, but we hope that those who do this master's degree um, go out into the world and do great new things because they've understood research, research processes. But pulling back to an earlier degree, and I'm very thrilled to say that we have a new student this year, delightful student, I've just met her from Delhi, who's just joined us in year one. And my goodness, she's already a great thinker. Is you're going to... um, She's so, actually from Pune, which is like in another state. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think already, because I met her and her father last week, um, I think she's going to be a dance scientist. How about that? That's and I find it very impressive that she's already so knowledgeable and rational in her thinking that she kind of knows what she wants to do. So anyway, anyone uh, doing a degree will experience a network of different kinds of things. If you're um, doing three years as a BA student with us, you have to do, um, I'm doing some quick sums here, um, something like 24 different modules across three years. So although you're focused as an undergraduate, you must also keep that breadth of knowledge. At master's degree, you pull it in, become narrower in focus, but look more deeply into what you're doing and really look at what words like um, critical analysis actually mean. And my goodness, you get a lot out of that. You're absolutely right, and it was a learning curve for me as well. Um, also, kind of new um, into this whole field when I joined in, I kind of read a lot more than probably anybody who would have been doing masters did because I didn't have a bachelor's. So that was very interesting for me as well because I ended up learning so much more about the entire dance field in just under a year. And I think the kind of learning that I have just brought in with me, I still go back to reading all of the papers. I just recently finished What is Art? You remember Betty Redfern's book, um, you know, chapter. So I kind of just finished it recently, um, but it is amazing. Um, and I think everybody should definitely go ahead and do a little bit of a research into what's available out there with respect to the courses that are offered. And University of Chichester is a great place to go and study dance at. The faculty are really warm, they're welcoming, they're also very easy to approach and even sit and discuss things with. The courses offered are easy to understand, the opportunities and the kind of support handed over just makes it easy for you to, you know, just go through the three years smoothly. And if you are dedicated, if you are passionate about dance, you will find a way to make it happen. That is dead on given. Uh, on that note, and I would just like to say thank you so much for this opportunity for me to interview you. I think our viewers have learned so much about you in the last 45 minutes. I cannot be any more thrilled than I am right now for being able to just do this with you. I'm honored, I am I'm blessed. I have, I mean, it's just, I am now fumbling for all good words <laughs> because I just don't know how to express this feeling. It's too much, I, I'm so honored. And I love having this connection with all of you in India and perhaps elsewhere. And I embrace you in this very sad time when we can't embrace people. No. But for the love of dance, keep dancing. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning into Movement and Me, an initiative that is designed for budding artists across the world. To continue receiving notifications on our latest episode, Please subscribe to our YouTube channel Nati Mandalam or look us up on Apple Podcasts or Spotify for more information. I'm your host Niharika and I'll see you all next time.